You're listening to The Philip Jordan Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome in to The Philip Jordan Show. I am your host, Philip Jordan, from Last World on College Football and 96.9 The Legend in Dothan, Alabama, where I'm the in-studio host and producer. Dothan Woods Football coming to you from Studio B here on this Thursday. Got a fun show. Now, I told you guys on Tuesday, may or may not have a Thursday show. So I pretty much wish you well on your week. Well, we're here on Thursday. Uh, we have a show, and it is going to be a good one. A little change of pace here on the day on the show. We're going to jump into the National Football League and talk about New Orleans Saints and what they have done. During the all season, and my guest in a few moments will be John Hendricks, a Saints lead writer and reporter for the Saints News Network, which is part of Sports Illustrated. He's also over on the Boot Crew Media uh, as a video host over there. So, uh, really fun stuff. We will talk about uh, how long he's been covering the Saints. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll also just look at what they've done in all season, particularly Derek Carr, new quarterback, uh, other all season moves kind of how, how this team should be the favorite in the division. So a lot of fun stuff there with John. And then we're actually going to piggyback off something we talked about on Tuesday show, the Hugh Freeze comments about a solution, uh, maybe perhaps to make spring better. Uh, we have some coaches in the state. There's one in particular that has not said anything uh, of this recording, but there are three coaches in the state that agree would you freeze on that? So I will discuss all that and we will jump into the mailbag as well. You can check out the Philip Jordan show on Apple podcast, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're on Apple podcast, please follow rate and review, leave a review and I'll read it on a future edition of the show. And if you just leave four stars, you're just a straight up hater. You can also check out the show over on my YouTube channel, the Philip Jordan media YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell for all notifications, and please leave a comment on a video, and I'll read it on a future edition of the show. You can follow me on social media at PJordanSCC, or you can email me at sports.philipjordan at gmail.com. Everybody joining me on the show today, we are talking to New Orleans Saints, and I am being joined by John Hendricks. You can check out his work. He's Saints lead writer and reporter at the Saints News Network, part of Fan Nation at SI.com, and the video host for Boot Crew Media. And, uh, John, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show and uh, talk about New Orleans Saints. Hey, I appreciate you having me for reaching out and everything. So it's always a pleasure to meet other people that share the passion for football and stuff that I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've always called myself a football degenerate where it's just I watch it all the time. Uh, college, high school, pro, XFL, USFL, CFL, if it's all, I'll, I'll, if I see football and watch it. So, yeah, it's a, it's it's a great. And uh, I'm glad to have you on. And uh, uh, before we jump into the Saints, though, uh, how long have you been covering the first time guest on the show? I always like to ask these kind of questions uh, to a first time guest. Uh, how long have you been uh, covering the Saints? Whew, uh, over a decade now. So now it feels like it. So don't let the little, the, uh, the young baby face fool you. I'm, I'm a little bit older than, than normal, but, um, you know, look, yeah, over 10 years and such. And so, uh, you know, doing this in a full-time real big capacity since 2017, 2016, something like that. But been around this team for a long time, uh, you know, watching, observing, seeing all the things. And so just one of those guys that, you know, was doing plenty of other things and, and finally found something that I love doing. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, you, if you love something, it should never be work. And it doesn't it never really feels like work for me. So uh, a lot of experience under the belt with New Orleans covering this team. And uh, especially the last five, six years have been really, really something to watch. Yeah, I, I feel you uh, on on the first part when you said the, the baby face because I look a whole lot. I am a whole lot older than I look like I am uh, as well. But uh, I, I get to so say you're like 21. I'm like no, no, go a little higher, go a little higher. But yeah, uh, a lot higher for me. <laughs> I it's all good. It's all good. When we get like in our 50s and 60s and stuff like that, we'll be uh, it, it'll be good. So uh, it, yeah. it'll work out at the at the end there. Um, before we jumped into what's the Saints offseason, just kind of briefly look back at the 2022 season. Because going in, uh, this team was acting like a team that was ready to compete uh, with all the additions they added before going into 22. Quarterback 
Winston and Dalton was the was the you look so, but the, the quarterback is kind of like the eyesore. Of what's going to go on there? But just look at a team that went seven and ten, three way tie for second or last place in the division, if whichever way you want to you want to do it. But uh, what were your thoughts just coming out of the twenty two season with the Saints? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is missed opportunity, right? Um, you look at this team. Back half of the year, the defense was playing so great. You know, eight straight games, allowing opponents 20 points or less, and then they only won half of those. And so that kind of just sums up the problems, you know, mostly around the offensive side of the ball. I mean, there's just so many things that you look at. And and look, coming off of rewinding no Sean Payton, Dennis Allen, continuity, compete now mode, those are all the things that we talked about at the beginning of the year. And, and you know, kind of, I don't say believe, but just – you could see it and you can make the case and argument for it. And then the season plays out, you know, uh, first game. Uh, great. You know, we, that hype against Michael or, uh, uh, up for Michael Thomas was real. He is outstanding in training camp. He looked great in that first week. And then the Carolina game, everything just looked ugly. And then obviously you have the problems with Winston. You have the problems that, that dealt with the injury. They turned to Andy. Um, the offense just could never find a groove. And, and they were just so talented in a lot of areas, especially defensively and, you know, there were a lot of missing parts and pieces. They had really bad luck with injuries last year. But, you know, even to be in a space where they rallied and were able to even be in a spot where they could make the postseason was interesting. I would have loved to see them try or get in. But, you know, missed opportunities overall for the season. Just wasn't as, as great as what you were expecting. Um, and, you know, look, again, one of two things you could say, hey, it's a learning experience. But you can also say this is two years now that this team – who was really one of the premier teams from 2017 to before, you know, the losing season that came, they were always in the mix. And so now it's kind of like, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but, you know, just full of disappointment a little bit and also just a lot of fluky stuff. But, man, you know, last year was still a fun ride. Not as fun to watch through some of these games as it has been in, in recent memory. But, you know, it's it's football. So anything can happen. We see teams that do this all the time. So now it's really important time for them. Yeah, it's really amazing because you look at it last season. Tampa Bay won the division eight nine, so it, you're right. It was a game or two, and your division champions, and you're you're in the playoffs on that defense. It would have been uh, interesting. Of course, the the big uh, thing in the off season, uh, Derek Carr uh, signing uh, with the uh, with the Saints on a four year contract. And, and my personal feeling, I, I've always been a fan of Derek Carr. I think he is a really good quarterback. Uh, two seasons ago, or you could argue he was a top ten quarterback in the league last year. Didn't go so well for you, but for for him, for so when you look at Derek Carr, what do you see as a quarterback and how he adds to the Saints? Yeah, I mean leadership is the first thing. I think he brings a calmness to to things. And look, you know, in talking with him, he's he's not here to take over. He's only here to enhance and to add to what the Saints have in the locker room. And so, look, he's a guy that I think a lot of people have gotten really excited about. You know, you got to think with his time with the Raiders, he never had anything better than a twentieth ranked defense. So New Orleans obviously can offer that. He's in a division where now you can play in the Dome still, obviously, uh, almost half of your games. And, well, even more because you got Atlanta and such. But I, I think you look at him, one of the things that they were missing last year, somebody that that brought the calmness that could also execute. And there's nothing wrong with what Andy did last year in the offense. But there were clear limitations with the way Dalton was able to run the offense. And it was just one of those things where he could manage the game, he wasn't going to set it all on fire, but with the car, you get the upgrade. You kind of get the guy that's that's uh, a mix of Jameis and Andy, but the upside is what I would say. And, you know, things along the lines of, look, when Drew Brees hung it up, uh, all of the line checks went to Eric McCoy on the offensive line, and Derek Carr is a guy that can come in here. He's going to be able to – and expected to do a lot of that, right? And so he's going to have a lot more control of the offense. He has a good marriage – or not say marriage, but good um, – partnership already with Pete Carmichael, their offensive coordinator. So I think that's obviously going to bode well for him. And so you get him some offensive weapons, you give him a chance to shine. Obviously he's not coming in here for perfection, which we know we understand, but he doesn't have to be that guy. He doesn't have to be Drew Brees or anything like that. I think he's a, a, a guy that can come in here, lead him to a division title, just get him into the dance and then let everything take care of the rest. But they got some really exciting weapons around him. They've got a pretty strong offensive line defensively I think there's a couple of things to address but you know look with Derek Carr at the helm you know if you put him in a situation last year with the same team they're in the playoffs they're probably a, a 10 or 11 win team and you know who knows what would happen from there 
Yeah, I don't know how many times I'll be watching uh, Red Zone on Sundays, and with, with he, when he was on the Raiders, you you flipping that last that 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 um, afternoon window, the Raiders are in a shootout with somebody, and then Derek Carr's got to find a way. So for him, he's got to be looking. Uh, the first time that he's not in that situation, he's going, like, "Whoa, I don't know what this is like. My defense has got me covered." Oh, <laughs> uh, how surprised were you that uh, that Jameis Winston came back to the Saints? I don't know if I'd say super surprised because I think there's a couple of things to look at here, right? I think obviously for Winston, you know, you could say he could have looked at a situation and said, hey, I can come in and compete to be a starter. I don't think many teams said this is be a guy that we would consider our starter from day one, right? So that's a situation to look at. You know, I think when you look at it, I mean, he, he was a great teammate here. He was a great guy in the locker room very respected, supportive of his teammates, even though the roles that he didn't really, uh, you know, were envisioning for himself were, were what he was doing. Um, I mean, there was a lot of upside of what Jameis Winston. So his character, his professionalism, his, his leadership, all these things are such desirable qualities. And, you know, for him, it's unfortunate because I, I was waiting for two seasons to see the Jameis Winston that could potentially bring to this offense. And so it just never came through. And, um, you know, for him, I think being that he's Derek's backup, obviously that's the clear message here. It, you know, look, he can, can learn, he can focus on getting healthy and look, I'm not so sure that, you know, if he does really well in training camp and preseason that they don't give him an opportunity or a team says, Hey, we want to trade for this guy or something like that. So I think it's a pretty smart move for him um, just because it's familiar here. It gives him an opportunity. Look, it's only a one-year deal. He can still, you know, make the best of it and the team could definitely look, I think it's the best insurance policy this team could have to Derek Carr. It's definitely the best tandem that they have in the NFC South by far. If you stack them up to a lot of these quarterback situations, I take Carr and Winston any day. So look, I, he's going to be ready if something happens. Hopefully nothing happens, but he's a guy that's that's proved himself more value than just being on the field. And so, uh, you know, I was just hoping that he could knock off that narrative of being a turnover machine in 2019. He learned under Drew, learned the offense, was excited to do things. We saw glimmers of him before he got that ACL injury last year. I think, you know, again, he had a, an opportunity. It wasn't perfect, but he didn't need him to be perfect. He, he could have came in here and did pretty good, but we just never got to see it. Yeah, and, and how many teams out there have a backup quarterback that's got the starting experience that he does? I mean, and that's right. another thing. So you, you don't – he's kind of a guy I think you don't have to restrict the offense when he comes in. There's a lot of backups. Okay, we've got to change our offense. He's a guy – you don't really have to do that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think when you look at, again, another year in this offense, familiarity with the offense, I mean, I think those types of things matter. And, again, I don't think – continuity is the way you were it's just the familiarity and there's a lot of moving parts and pieces of the saints team you know new assistants some longtime assistants have gone and really this is a thing where you know this team is, is said they're going to keep pete carmichael in the capacity that they have and there's a lot of pressure on pete to do some some things and, and look Jameis is a guy that's smart and puts in the work and film study one of the first guys here for last to leave type of mentality. I think he's going to help Derek out and Derek's going to help him out a lot. And I, I think this is going to be a, a really good pairing for the saints team. So, so looking at the rest of the saints off season so far, just in, in, in kind of remove the Derek Carr part of out. How, how would you grade the saints off season? I think it's strong. You know, it's unfortunate that they lost some of their pieces. So I'd say from a loss perspective, you know, I, I'm surprised at the defensive tackle Paydays, you know, and, and look, congrats to, to David on Yamana, Shai Tuttle, Caden Ellis. They got paid. Same thing with Marcus Davenport for a guy that had a half sack, right? I mean, they got they got paid pretty well. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, good for them because I think Caden Ellis is one that, I mean, not, I think they, they wanted to keep him. They just knew that the price would be, you know, probably a little bit out of the reach. And so, um, you know, he get, moves on to greener pastures, but Shai Tuttle. So it, it, it creates obviously holes there. And so on one breath, it stinks because you lose some of these guys. Now, you know, of those, Caden Ellis probably is the one guy I thought you could resign, uh, you know, and I thought that you would probably bring back. And, um, you know, Davenport needs a fresh start. But, look, you look at some of these additions. I think Jamal Williams on the offensive side of the ball is one of the most underrated type of moves that this team make. Um, you know, there's the Alvin Kamara stuff that you got to wait pay attention to. From everything I understand, the Saints are expecting him to be suspended. But, 
you know, bracing for him to be suspended, but we'll see how that had obviously plays out in, in the process. It's going to stretch into training camp, but on the defensive side of the ball, you know, guys like Colin Saunders are going to be a big deal. You know, you get guys like Jonathan Abram, that's, that's going to come in here. Um, you know, guys like Lonnie Johnson, people that are players that, you know, the saints, when they do free agency, something that I believe is, is a big difference for Dennis Allen is that he doesn't sell them on nonsense. He doesn't sell them on, this perfect vision or like, you know, you go to New York, you probably get the full tour, you get all this, this VIP treatment, all this other stuff. And it's a reason why they landed Derek Carr is they knew who Derek Carr was as a person. He's not some ritzy toity guy that you have to, to go. His guy is going to show up in shorts and a hoodie and just be comfortable. Right. And so mm-hmm. they, they, that's how their, their meetings went with him. That's where the restaurant selection went with him, all that type of stuff that mattered. And so I think free agency wise, Look, I, I think all the moves so far are probably a solid B, maybe a higher, maybe B plus, because there's still other holes that need to be addressed. But, you know, look, some of the guys that they brought in, um, you know, backfill some of the other positions. They still need to work on some depth positions. And, you know, again, I feel like between that, the moves that they made are great. But the moves that they did, keeping Michael Thomas, keeping James Winston, being able to keep a lot of their own was even a bigger deal for him because you don't have to necessarily start over. You get guys who are experienced, know what to expect here. I think those are the moves that really pay off dividends. You know, and obviously we know we're less than a month away from, from the draft. They have that 29th pick in the first round that they got from the trade with Denver with uh, Sean Payton. And, you know, you mentioned defense tackle and I'm doing my research. I mean, they do seem – thin there now uh, is that a spot you think they could go with draft or you think they could go somewhere else i've also seen uh some, some quarterbacks are are being met with like uh clayton tune and i know hendon hooker was one uh where do you think they could or should go uh with that that draft pick in the first round i mean if you're asking me now it's got to be defensive tackle right mm-hmm. just because they at one point they had just a reserve future guy on they had two free agents they uh, brought back one of their own in Malcolm Roach. So there's there's a lot on that position that needs to be sorted out. Now, one of the things to think about is Ryan Nielsen's no longer the defensive line coach. He did a lot of rotational work. I don't know if Grantham, their new defensive line coach, is going to do the same approach or they're trying to find a starter guy like Aaron Donald maybe to, to play the bulk of snaps. I mean, that remains to be seen. So as of right now, based off the needs that are most pressing, defensive tackle is the top one that I would say. Now, as far as other ones, you know, I could make the argument of a, a pass catcher, like a tight end, you know, a Dalton Kincaid. That would be make a lot of sense for this team. Um, you know, they got Jawan Johnson. Obviously, Taysom Hill is a guy that continues to be, you know, used wherever they need him <laughs> to and, and such. And uh, you have Adam Troutman, more of his, known for his blocking, but can do some things there um, and creative. And so I think that's a position that could potentially get upgraded. And so, look, I think those are the two most pressing. A quarterback – Based off of what I said earlier with Jameis Winston, if there's a scenario where they say, okay, we feel like we want to take Hendon Hooker, which rightfully so, if they did that, he'd probably sit behind the bench for a few years, right? And Mm -hmm. it'd be like a a Jordan Love situation, Aaron Rodgers situation, right? Because they're committed to Derek Carr. I mean, it's a four-year contract, so they technically would have it out on that fourth year. But look, I don't see that changing anytime soon, especially if Carr comes in and does what everybody expects him to and what they hope he's going to accomplish. So, um you know, if that's the case and that's the vision, I don't know if 29th is where you pull the trigger. I expect Hendon Hooker probably to go in that first round, late back half of that first round. But, you know, the Saints are a team that's obviously going to be paired to them and it's going to be a thing until it's not. But defensive tackles where they need to upgrade. They're going to have to backfill linebacker depth, um, you know, possibly another safety potentially or somebody in the secondary versatility. Offensive line. I, I could also make the argument for a pass rusher because they – they may need somebody else because Cam's getting up there, but he's still playing good ball. Peyton Turner is a guy that, look, I, I think he's in a, a pivotal year. He's got to be available. He's a guy that's got to shed that first round bust label. They've got Tano and they obviously have Carl Granderson. So I think they have good depth there, good rotation, but maybe they're looking for a guy that can come in and replace Cam eventually. And, and look, Cam's going to play until he can't, until the Saints are going to kick him out. Right. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think defensive line, Offensive line, those are probably the two pay, picks that you, or places that you look at and say, okay, that's probably, I wouldn't say the safest pick, but that would make the most sense right now. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll just did a quarter. I saw him at Hooker yesterday or the other day, and I saw the Clayton uh, uh, tune too as well, which I saw him play against Auburn in the bowl game a few years ago. That, that was my first exposure to him. And I said, okay, he looks a part of a pro quarter rat, but yeah. Uh, 
and it just kind of closing up. You, you kind of we're, we're talking. This is April. The, the draft hasn't happened. You know, it hadn't hit any kind of camps or anything like that. But this team, in your opinion, they should be the overwhelming. I'm maybe not overwhelming, but for sure the favorite in the NFC South, unless a certain 45 year old quarterback decides the the unretire again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't see that happening. That would be something. But, you know, look, I, I would tell you that I thought, you know, a few weeks ago, especially when they landed Derek Carr, they, they're they definitely got to be the favorites, considered mm-hmm. favorites. Now, I do like some of the things that Carolina's done. I like some of the things Atlanta has done. The problem with both of those teams is they still don't have their quarterback situation to figure out. So if you're going to sell me that Baker Mayfield is a guy in Tampa or you're going to sell me that – you know, Carolina is going to roll with Andy Dalton, or you're going to sell me on an idea that, you know, Atlanta is really committed to Desmond Ritter, then I don't buy that. Right. And I don't think that's enough to get you nine, 10, 11 wins to win the division. Right. And so look, I I like what Atlanta's done. I think they're probably one of the most, you know, most prep teams to make a a run at it, but they still got to put it together. Same thing with the saints, same thing with the Panthers. Bucks, I feel like, are mostly an afterthought right now. I mean, they're going to be going through a heavy rebuild. May get a quarterback. You know, I, I just don't see that Baker Mayfield or Kyle Trask are going to be your guys that, that get you the, the next step of where you want to go. I mean, it's really going to be a tough year to watch in Tampa. But I think the Saints have got to be the favorites. I would expect them to win the division as of right now. Um, now, things are going to change because everybody's got to remember that free agency is ongoing. So leading up to training camp, we're sitting here in April. Season still five plus months away, um, you know, a lot can change between then. But if they draft the right pieces, they can stay healthy. And some of these guys can can stay available during, you know, you know OTAs and training camp, mini camp, all this stuff. I feel really good about them being not only a division winner, but also getting one of the higher seeds in the NFC. Because, look, that the, the conference is right for the taking. There's only a couple of teams that you say, OK, feel really good about them. Others, you're like, I could kind of poke holes in just about all these other teams, right? And so I think the Saints have an opportunity here. And, you know, AFC is definitely the more dominant conference right now. And look, for the Saints, I I don't think, based on all these expectations, all the things, if they can't at least get in the wild card with some of the talent they've assembled, with all these things that have happened, something's definitely a lot more wrong here than uh, what's what's on the surface. But, uh, again, right now, April 5th is what we're recording they got to win the division. Yeah, and honestly, with Derek Carr, they have one of the best quarterbacks in the NFC now. I mean, when you look when you look at the rest of the conference, that quarterback. I mean, the AFC is the loaded conference quarterback wise. I mean, seems like everybody's wanting to go to the AFC as a quarterback, but uh, you know, Derek Carr, you do have one of the better quarterbacks in the conference too, as well. So that's not just the division; that's the conference. But uh, John, I'm looking forward. I'm ready. I'm ready for September to get here. I'm just ready to, uh, for them to start playing uh, on Sundays again. Uh, but uh, we got to wait. We got to wait. It's gonna be fun to see what they do in the draft and what goes on between that and the season. I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, spending twenty minutes with us to talk all things New Orleans Saints. If the listeners and viewers want to follow you online, where can they find you and check out all the work you're doing? Yeah, just the easiest thing is going on Twitter at John J Hendricks. It's Hendricks, just like Jimmy, how you spelled it. That's the right way to spell Hendricks. You know, not like the gin or whatever, but uh, you know, that's the first step. And then going to si.com slash NFL slash Saints or Saints.media. All of those work. And then on YouTube, just look up Boot Crew Media. That's K R E W E. If you're from the South, you understand. So, or if you're from Louisiana, you probably understand that. And other people are like, what is that? So, <laughs> that's the easiest ways to find me. Find my work. Twitter, always active, always available. If you follow me for game days, I will spoil your game for you because I live in the future, apparently. So, sorry. There you go. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert if uh, if you follow John. But anyway, John, I uh, appreciate the time, and I look forward to talking again sometime down the road. All right. Thanks, man. appreciate you. Let me tell you about my friend Brandon Eisenman's new podcast, Talking Knowles. Brandon's keeping the talking podcast alive twice a week. Brandon discusses the latest news in Florida State Athletics and interviews people involved with the program. Check out Talking Knowles on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, back to the Phil Jordan Show. All right, once again, thanks to John for coming on the show. A lot of fun. Uh, mix it up, you guys. You know, lately, we've been doing a lot of college football-related uh, guests and conversation here on the Phil Jordan Show. And uh, just kind of wanted to throw the NFL out there. I know a lot of people in my audience, too, are probably – New Orleans Saints fans as well. We'll see them get back uh, to where they were when uh, Drew Brees was there. Sean Payton, of course, Sean Payton's now with the Broncos. 
Drew Brees retired two years ago. But uh, I think uh, they should be the favorite in uh, the NFC South. And just kind of just quickly, I wanted to uh, to look at that, uh, look at uh, the NFC South. And uh, when you look at uh, some of the teams here, and you heard John mention it uh, there in our conversation, um, about the Carolina Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons have made some really good and interesting moves uh, here in the all season. And I, I'm mainly going to talk about, okay, let's talk Tampa Bay. Uh, Tom Brady retired. Uh, everybody knows, knows that piece of business. And look, I, I look at Tampa Bay. I think it's tear down. It is rebuild. It is reorganized. All that good stuff. So for them, look, I think if we were, we're talking about this early April before the draft, uh, they're the worst team right now in that division. I mean, they bring in Baker Mayfield, but that's just a Band-Aid. It's, it's not going to be something that you can really hang your hat on. But with the Carolina Panthers and what's big with them, I mean, and I, I really want to focus on offensively in the discussion C.J. Stroud versus Bryce Young. Look, y'all know where I stand on this. I would go with Bryce Young, number one. Uh, but there has been some, I talked, you know, the Panthers like Stroud. So, either one. Now, part of that deal was DJ Moore wide receiver. But you look at it, receiver, DJ Chark. You had him. Now, he's had some injury issues. Adam Thielen, veteran. Uh, you had a good running back in Miles Sanders, over 1,000 yards last year for the Eagles. Signed a four-year deal. Add him with Chubba Hubbard. Then you have a solid tight end that you signed in Hayden Hurst. You do bring in Andy Dalton on a two-year deal, so as a guy that could be the starter if you do not think Stroud is ready. You bring back center Bradley Bozeman. They pretty much got their offensive line from last year intact. They were fifth rushing in the NFL. They did make some signings on the defensive front. Shy Tuttle come from the Saints. And Deshaun Williams is another one that, you know, really have a solid defensive line. So when you look at the Panthers here, they're built for whoever the new quarterback is. And if we just looked at these moves, you take quarterback away. So, wow, the Panthers have really done some good things. They went 17 last year as well. New head coach, Frank Wright. But the quarterback, as you said there, with John. And Atlanta, they've really bolstered uh, their uh, their defense there as well. They bring back defense of Ian Lorenzo Carter. They signed a linebacker, uh, Kading Ellis. You know, he was a guy for the Saints. Uh Another guy from the Saints you talked about uh, there with John, uh, David Onyemata. Uh, he is a uh, big, big play there, big player there at defense tackle and then safety Jesse Bates. So they have done stuff too as well. But at the end of the day, kind of like what we were talking there with John, I mean, the, the Saints, just and something big happens uh, within uh, the draft, any other free agency, whatever, you have to believe that. The Saints are just the overall favorite. And I'll say this. I think the Saints have the best two quarterbacks in the division uh, when you also add in uh, Jameis Winston into the mix as well. All right, so I told you guys on top, I was also going to talk about, kind of go over some more stuff on something we talked about on Tuesday. And that was Hugh Freeze's comments about what he would do with spring games. And if you didn't listen to the show on Tuesday, here's what Hugh Free said on Monday about maybe some changes he would make to spring games in college football. The solution is allow us to scrimmage somebody on a day, another team. And I think everybody would get out of it exactly what they want. And if everybody's doing that, then – um you know, and let's adopt a charity um, to give all the proceeds to, um, you know, let's, let's take foster care in the state of Alabama or, or orphan care in the state of Alabama and let's all, let's Alabama play uh, Troy and we play UAB or vice versa or whoever, I don't care, or Alabama State or, or, or whoever, and people will come see that. And, you're decreasing your injury um, possibilities by 50%. 
and coaches are smart enough to control. We're not going to hit each other's quarterbacks. We practice that way. And if you want to put a blue jersey or a different jersey on somebody that's don't take to the ground, we can do that. And I just think it would be great for the sport. I think it would be awesome. NFL gets to scrimmage against others. High schools get to scrimmage against each other. And I just, for the life of me, I don't understand why we haven't gotten to that point where we can pull that off. and do something that would be helpful to, to, to some organization in each state. And if every college, every state did this, man, we could make an impact on some people that need it. And, um, that would be my idea. And, so that was the, uh, and I, I played that. And I, and that came from AL.com YouTube account, but that, that audio did. I played that on Tuesday. I'm going to play it again today in case we just have new people coming in uh, didn't, and did not hear uh, Hugh Freeze comments uh, this past Monday about that. And I, I said, I'm not going to go too much detail, but I did say on Tuesday, I'm for this. I've been for this. I think it would be more beneficial playing at somebody else instead of yourself uh, in these kind of spring games. And as Hugh Freeze, if you did it for charity, people would come out. It would be, uh, it could really do some positive things if you did this. So we've had some coaches in the state of this recording uh, that have come out and given their opinion on this. Uh, let, let's start off with John Sumrall from Troy. He had this to say. I wouldn't have a problem with it. I'd go play. And this is from 24-7 Sports. Do you get caught up in preparing for the game more than just using spring as a development time for individuals? And for experimenting, adapting, and growing within your systems on offense, defense, and in a kicking game. Those are the only drawbacks I see. So, yeah, from the devel developmental side, John Summerall does make, I think, a good point here. You would probably get too, or you could get too wrapped up into preparing for a game instead of getting the competitor and you want to win uh, in development and that kind of thing. So, he's he's for it. But he's also like, hey, there's this side of it that, that could happen to as well. Now, UAB head coach, new head coach, Trent Dilfer, uh, he spoke to the media about this. And this comes from AL.com. And this is what he had to say on the topic. Trent Dilfer, pretty, pretty, pretty pleased. Yes, of course, he's right. We all want, whether you're Auburn or Alabama, you're looking for live competition. You're looking not to play yourself. If you're UAB or Troy, you're looking to play people perceive much better than you, and you can use it as a test to see where your program is at. And if you do really well, that gives you so much confidence leaving the spring and then going into fall camp and all that stuff. You're so momentum. And just think, too, going into media days uh, for these smaller schools or even the bigger schools, if you see a good performance, that could ramp it up some momentum, a lot more tension, a lot more hype too as well. So uh, Trent Dilfer is on board. Now, South Alabama coach uh, Kane Woman spoke with 105.3, 105.5 FM, excuse me, WNSP there in Mobile on Wednesday. And uh, he was quoted as saying, basically the model in football is you are going to play another team, organization, whatever, prior to your first game of the season. I think the end of spring would be a fitting time to do that. All we're doing essentially is adding another non-conference opportunity. The difference is you get to handle it in a different way. You get to focus on what you want to focus on because there is no consequence to winning or losing that football game. It's kind of like NFL preseason. You know, you kind of if you want to get a look at a player or or maybe a formation or or something you want to try out. You can experiment here in this situation because, like you said, you're not worried if you're going to lose the football game. You're not going to get fired over losing the scrimmage. Uh, so those coaches now, unless something ha has it gets out before uh, I get done recording, uh, no word from Nick Saban on this yet. So I'll be interested to see uh, uh, when Nick Saban, if he does, uh, talk on this topic. But uh, very interesting. Just kind of want to give an update on that topic that we talked about on Tuesday's show. All right, so I'm going to take a quick 26-second break. We're going to do the mailbag after that. 
If you enjoy this podcast and live in the southeast area of Alabama, check out the Wiregrass High School Football Report brought to you by DGO Strategies. During high school football season, I talk with local coaches and look at the biggest stories and games. The show will be returning soon, and you can check it out on Apple Podcasts, the Philip Jordan Media YouTube channel, or 969thelegend.com. Now, back to the Phil Jordan Show. All right, now we're going to jump into the mailbag, which I'm going to have to make another post soon to get some more questions for the mailbag. But uh, and I have been getting a lot of XFL questions, which I, I enjoy. I watch it. Uh, TV ratings aren't showing why people are watching it or attending it, but uh, I enjoy it. But uh, so here's the question uh, for today's show. This comes from Destin Baker. All right, guys, I know, long time listener. What will be the next cities to get an XFL team? That's an interesting question. And, of course, the USFL might is that up, which I know the Houston Gamblers aren't playing in Houston. They're still doing the hub. They they won't be there. Uh, they'll be playing in, in the Memphis hub. But could we have a situation where there's two, Mem- where there's two Houston teams? Uh, of course, you got the Roughnecks in the XFL, the Gamblers in the USFL. I don't think they should add any quite yet. You need to just stay with eight. Now, I, I would say this. I think Las Vegas needs to move to a different location. I just not work in Cashman Field. They're getting like 6,000 people there. Some soccer stadium, minor league baseball stadium. It just doesn't look great. It, it, it's not the best look on TV. It, it does look minor league, honestly. Uh, be honest with you on that one. I would move them to probably like San Diego or, or Salt Lake, so that might be a thing there. I'm trying to think of other teams that we might want to move. I think that's the only one uh, I would move for sure. Uh, I guess you could make arguments for other cities, but that would be the one. But uh, other than that, if you, if you don't, I don't think there should be a ninth or a tenth team in the XFL next season. You need to build with the eight. Don't be too um, – Anxious on expanding. Uh, I've seen other leagues try that and end up failing because uh, you, you try to get too big too fast. Just perfect what you've got now and then move forward with some other teams. That's kind of what I would do with it. But I appreciate it, uh, Destin, for that question. And if you ever want to get a question or a opinion or a topic or anything on the Phil Jordan Show, uh, you can email me at sports.philjordan at gmail.com. Uh, you can hit me up on social media, P. Jordan SEC. More Twitter on that. You can leave a comment uh, or a, re- a review on Apple Podcast. Uh, you can do that as well. I always appreciate the reviews. And you can also uh, leave a comment on the video, and I will read that on a future edition as well. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Philip Jordan Show. I guess a surprise edition of the show since how I close it out on Tuesday that there might not be another one uh but anyways uh, i'm gonna get out of here once like i said on tuesday hope you everybody has a great weekend we'll be back on tuesday we will be recapping the auburn spring game uh next week alabama's coming up we got a lot of bunch of spring games coming up on the 15th that we're gonna be paying attention to so gonna gonna have a lot to get through on next week on the two shows but it's gonna be a lot of fun and i will be looking forward uh to talking to you guys with it once again I hope every single one of you, you have a great weekend. Uh, Be kind to each other. Uh, Always do the right things. Uh, Always let kindness be your compass. You've been listening and watching The Phil Jordan Show. Thanks for listening to The Philip Jordan Show. Subscribe to the audio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can watch the show over at the Philip Jordan Media YouTube channel. Got a question or topic idea? Email the show at sportstalkphilipjordan at gmail.com. Join us next time for more great football talk.